You are the salt of the earth, but if salt loses its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trodden underfoot by men. So we're continuing our look at uh, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Last week we looked at the very beginning of the Sermon on the Mount and uh, Jesus' teaching of the Beatitudes, which we said was something like an MRI of his interior life, and we kind of highlight the reality that um, we're all supposed to have each of these Beatitudes, so they're not like charisms or gifts of the Spirit, where, you know, like some people have one thing and other people have another thing. I'm supposed to have all of them. Today we're continuing with this uh, Sermon on the Mount, and we're going to look at just two verses. So it's Matthew 5, verses 13 and 14, and what I just read is Matthew 5, 13. I mentioned last week, I think, there's a really an extraordinary little commentary in the Gospel of Matthew called The Fire of Mercy, Heart of the Word, and rather than try to memorize uh, what it is that um, Mary Caucus writes, I thought I'd just share this with us because I think it's an extraordinary reflection on what Jesus is trying to say to us with regards to uh, this passage. So it's more literally, um, but if salt becomes insipid. So here's what Mary Caucus writes. Christians are not only to be virtuous, they are to be salt. That is, they are to raise the level of flavor of every human activity and thus transform it. One of the challenges for many of us, I think, is we kind of begin the life of discipleship is we can um, almost mistakenly think that the goal of everything is just to become holy as if holiness means you know personal piety freedom from sin those kinds of things all very important to be sure but it, the Lord doesn't call us to himself so that we'll just go retreat into a cave and you know live immune from the world or untouched by the world he calls us to himself penetrates our lives and then sends us into a decaying world so that we would, by our presence and his grace at work within us, by the power of the gospel, make the decaying world actually come back to life, preserve those things that are in danger of being lost. So he says, what is of, what is of itself insipid can become delightful if seasoned with joy and devotion. How can I be the salt in the life of those around me, he asks. How can I season their distress and thus open their appetite for the great adventure of grace. He goes on to write, the Greek word here for becoming insipid means literally to become foolish, sharing a root with the word sophomore, which literally means wise fool. No offense to those of you who are sophomores. Similarly, the Latin for tasteless is insipidus, meaning that no longer knows. A thing is wisest, when it is most fully itself, when it tastes most like itself in keeping with its nature. It is foolish when it forgets to be what it is, when it no longer has its proper flavor, as when salt loses its strength, or when oil becomes rancid, or when wine turns to vinegar. Salt is one of those primary realities that can contribute to enhancing the quality of other things, but that is itself hopeless once it goes bad. As in the case of water and fire, what can substitute for salt? It can no longer be destined for man's mouth, but only for trampling by his feet. In saying that his disciples are the salt of the earth, get a load of this, Jesus is describing the critical character of the Christian vocation. Either the Christian heightens the quality of human life and makes it more palatable, more delightfully nourishing, or he has no reason for being. Let's hear that again. Either the Christian heightens the quality of human life and makes it more palatable, more delightfully nourishing, or he has no reason for being. Salt is not for itself, cannot be its own end, it serves a humble yet somehow indispensable purpose. Nothing can substitute for it. Insipid Christians, those who have lost their proper flavor, have forgotten their function as a condiment of society. 
They have forgotten the salt placed on their tongues at their baptism. No doubt they let this happen by blending into the common environment, out of exhaustion perhaps, or maybe out of fear to introduce a jarring note, a sharp, pungent flavor into the common endeavor. I, I find this to be such a rich commentary because of the things that Mary Caucus pulls out and, and this either or of what it means to be a Christian, I find to be um, provocative, uh, a bit jarring myself, but rich for reflection. Again, I think right now as we look at this particular passage, maybe a question for us to ask ourselves is just, how do I, do I know who I am? Do I know what the Lord's mission to all of us in baptism is? It is not to come away and be apart from the world. It is rather to, to be rejuvenated by the Spirit, to live in the midst of the world, and somehow by our very presence in the midst, letting the Lord move through us, transform the world. If all the believers retreat from the culture, then what happens? Now clearly, right now, in the culture in which you and I are living, this is going to cause for hardship and conflict. It always has, and right now it's in a particularly intense way on all sorts of issues, right? And yet the command from the Lord is still the same. I'm supposed to be salt and almost like a shaker, and He just wants to pour me wherever it is. So maybe a question, again, might be to think, so what are those, what are those foods, if you will, in my day-to-day? those people who are going to be near me, those situations I'm going to be in, and where does the Lord want to pick me up in His hand and just dispense a little salt so that He can use me and He can use you to bring the aroma of Christ and to make what is otherwise tasteless more flavorful. Let's look just quickly at Matthew 5, 14, this next line, which here at Good Counsel we're pretty familiar with, right? So, you are the light of the world, a city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do men light a lamp and put it under a bushel, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So we've, we've talked about this so many times, right, with the, the whole reality that the church, so I'm looking at the church right now as I'm looking out. So this is, the, I believe this is the third tallest point in Wayne County. So it's, it's significant for us that on the top of our church is this red light. So everybody who drives by here, when they pass by an M14, and they see that red light, they know that's a Catholic church because that right, red light triggers uh, or an indicator of the fact that the tabernacle's here, the Blessed Sacrament's here. So that's a great image for us. So you build a city up on top of a hill, but usually you build a city up on top of a hill for protection, for the sake of those who live in the city, so that they can be up high and they can look down, they have a good vantage point in case of people who are attacking it, which is what it would be like at the time of Jesus. You always built a city up high. It's easier to defend a city that's up high. That's why it's on a hill. But you don't light up a city on a hill to protect it. When you light it up, all you're doing is calling attention to it. You're calling attention to it in this case because people need to know that's a place of refuge. That's a safe harbor. For the people who are outside in the wilderness, outside the safety of the city walls, lost in the middle of the forest and the brambles and the thorns and the, the, the strewn with rocks, roads, they can see that light and they can go, that's where we've got to head, that's where we're going. And Jesus is saying, that's what you and I are called to be. We're called to be that as a community, first and foremost, and as individuals. So it's a good question for us to ask ourselves, is Our Lady of Good Counsel, is your discipleship group? Are we a group of people who are known to be a place that's safe? Not safe in the sense of, hey, whatever you want, doesn't matter, yeah, everybody's welcome here, doesn't matter what you do, I mean, not that. Safe in the sense of, no matter what somebody's present or their past is, they're going to receive a welcome here from the Lord. Might they be called to change and to convert and repent? I certainly have been and am continually called to do so. But the Lord doesn't first say, hey, stop doing that. The Lord calls me to himself. He wins me by his love. And then he begins to warm my heart and then show me the things that need to change. And then he goes on to talk about 
Men don't light a lamp and put it underneath a bushel or a basket, but on a stand so that it gives light to all in the house. So the Greek word that Jesus uses here is, is the word not for, you know, like a, a giant candle stand. It's for one of those little hand lamps. I have one of these in my office. So it's like a little brass lamp, small little candle on top, and it's got that hook, you know, for your finger that uh, Scrooge walked around the house with. So the imagery here is you and I, we're the lamp. Jesus is the hand. And he picks up the lamp. The house is the world. So in a real way, it's your world, like that area where you live, that area where I live. And each day Jesus wants to pick me up and bring me into different rooms in the house so that the room, which is dark, will become light. So when he talks about, you know, nobody lights this thing and then puts it underneath a basket, you know, sometimes it's worth asking the obvious questions. Well, why don't you do that? Why don't you light a lamp and then put it under a basket? Why don't you flip on the, the lights in your room and then cover them with duct tape? Well, you don't do that because that would be stupid, right? It would make no sense. And in a similar way, Jesus says, I have not placed my spirit in you so that you would hide it. I've placed my spirit in you so that you would let me pick you up and bring you into the different places in the world right now. So again, maybe a simple question for us to reflect on right now is, am I intentional in, first of all, being docile in the Lord's hands, letting him pick me up, letting him have his way. But then am I always kind of on the lookout for, Lord, where do you want to bring me today? So every day is a day in which you and I are being called to be missionaries. Every day we're being sent, or maybe in this case, we're being brought by the Lord, carried by the Lord into different environments, um, family settings, uh, work settings. Um, even something like Father Prentice said the other day at, uh, at a mass where he, he was just talking about, so you're out to dinner and you're, you know, you're, praying before dinner, as we always want to do. Many of us, I think, we kind of like look for the waitress or the waiter and we're like, okay, they're not coming, let's pray now. But instead, maybe you wait for them to come. Like be intentional about waiting for them to come and then say, hey, we're about to pray. Is there something right now we can pray for for you? Well, all of a sudden, we've let the Lord bring the light that is within us, His Spirit, into this situation and potentially illuminate the life of somebody who, who knows what's on their mind. Who knows what they're going through? The response of that person could be copious tears. <laughs> like, how did you know? I, I got a, a mom who's really sick right now who's, you know, in hospice. Yeah, it would be great. Would you pray for her? Thank you. Or whatever the situation might be. So let's be deliberate and intentional every day this week about being mindful that the Lord either wants to use, He wants to pour us out into the environments that we are, or he wants to pick us up and to carry us, either salt or a lamp, so that the gospel can be heard, so that what is potentially decaying might be preserved, and so that what's living in darkness might be illuminated. Let's pray for each other that God will use us powerfully this week to change just one person's life by sharing the gospel. God bless.